What do other people in the room here know about CAFOs, about industrial agriculture? Is it something that uh, people are pretty knowledgeable about? Or, you know, we, we sort of assume in, in Greene County, and they do in Kiwanee County and a lot of other places, uh, that... Um, we assume that you know what a CAFO is, but sometimes you don't. Raise your hand if you know what a confined animal feeding operation is. Okay. It's concentrated, all right. Concentrated or confined. It can be either one. The USDA says concentrated. Other ones say confined. Um, bottom line, though, is that those cows never get outside. They're all confined. They're confined. <laughs> they are. And... There are over 300 CAFOs in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, there are 1.28 million cows. Well, I, I, it's really, really, really tough. It's, it's hard to say. We've been fighting this for two and a half, three years. Pasture-raised uh, chickens, pigs, beef, turkeys. Uh, and um, she lives outside of a city called Broadhead in Wisconsin. It's in Greene County. City of about oh, know, 7,000 people. And a uh, fellow rapped on her door and says, handed her a piece of paper, says, sign this. And she says, what is this? He says, a manure lease. She says, what's a manure lease? She says, well, we're building this uh, 5,800 cow uh, concentrated animal feeding operation. That's what CAFO stands for, in case you're not aware. C A F O, concentrated animal feeding operation. About a quarter mile from your house, and we're going to be spreading. We learned later, 94 million gallons of liquid manure over about 7,000 acres, and they uh, they needed because they have all, they only they own only 127 acres. That's where this facility is sitting. Um, they um, they need to have man, what leases with farmers to accept the manure, uh, which is uh, part of what sometimes is called a nutrient management plan. They they don't use the, although the permit for spreading it is called a Wisconsin Pollution uh, Discharge Elimination System Permit, WPDS permit, uh, they call it nutrients because, I mean, manure is actually sort of a nutrient, uh, but there are all sorts of other things in it besides nutrients. There are uh, uh, process chemicals, the, uh, the detergents and so forth that they use to, uh, uh, to clean out the barns, to wash off the cattle. Uh, and also, uh, in many cases, uh, pretty high levels of antibiotics. So, uh, in any case, uh, he entered this paper, says, sign this, and she says, well, gee whiz, I, I, I'm not going to sign that. Uh, there began a two and a half year long process of uh, trying to keep this facility from being built. Um, if it is denied, if that permit is denied, it will be the very first one that the DNR in Wisconsin has not has denied. The very first one. Uh, we have 350 people on our mailing list. Uh, we've held several uh, public meetings, events where we bring folks in from all over the country to describe the uh, deleterious effects of, uh, of CAFOs on not only the environment, but rural economies, rural communities, uh, social fabric of rural communities. Uh, and this is sort of a five-minute movie that I think I'd, you'd get a lot of pleasure out of seeing. The USDA lab talked to me about the viruses in my water. He said, Linda, my heart goes out to you. He said, it goes out to all of you people in that town of Lincoln. He said, we don't expect to see water like this only if we're in a third world country. I knew I needed to get involved when 
We had been having coffee, a few friends of ours, and each week we sat down and we were looking at the issues that were taking place in our community. We said, you know, somebody should do something about that, you know, and we'd get together the next week and say, oh, you know, some other issue, and somebody should do something about that. Finally realized that, you know, we were the people that had to do that. When Midwest environmental advocates began working with citizens in Kewanee County, we held a training for people to show them that if they want to hold polluters accountable, there's only certain factors within the law that are available. Without MEA, the citizens here would never have been able to engage in permit challenges that actually question the the re regulations that are put in place by the DNR on the CAFOs that really were not protective of the groundwater or our community. We've been testing uh, waters here in Kiwani County for, I've been personally doing it for the last three years, and the samples that we take for Wisconsin DNR are just looking at phosphorus and turbidity. For one of the rivers, it's always way over the limits for safe water for aquatic life in our streams and rivers, and that's in the Shota River. I ran for town chairman mainly because I was tired of hearing every time I went to a board meeting that their hands were tied. There was nothing they could do um, about a lot of the issues in the, in the township that we have. So that was the main reason for, for getting involved and then just thinking about my kids' future and what it was gonna hold for them. The thing that really pushed us over the edge was when my wife was talking to our local legislator and he said to her, what level of contamination are you willing to accept for your community? It's time to make a change. Farming has to change. What you have been doing is not working. Look, look, you can't put 40, 50 tons of liquid manure on two to three or four feet. You can't do that. Gravity wins. People stepping up to defend their rights has created a process that is making change. There's good science that's been invested in Kwani County to understand the nature of the problems without people standing up and demanding action, there would be, I don't think there would be much going on at all. I certainly don't think there would be county ordinances. There wouldn't have been committees on safe drinking water. We have a friend that actually is a retired NASA scientist and he always said that NASA tried to hire the best and the brightest to make a team. And he's always been amazed that here in Kiwani County, that the best, the brightest, the, the, those people that are needed at the moment for a meeting or for, for whatever information is, is necessary, they show up. He says, NASA could never buy that. Only a community that is truly engaged can come up with the diversity that that our community has, has, has shown. And to be a part of that is something that you just can't understand until you really step up and, and take that first step to be, to, to join in with the rest of your community to really stand up for what's right for everybody. So this is what one of these, this is what one of these what operations look like. These are the That's barns. These are, these are hundreds of feet long, these here, it's a long shot. This is called a manure lagoon. Some people call it an open cesspool, which is what it is. Uh, the, one in, uh, the one in Broadhead, they're actually building it. They don't have the permit to operate, but they've had the permit to build it. They're in the process of building it. They spent millions of dollars in pouring tens of thousands of tons of concrete. Um, and the manure lagoon, they'll have four about like this, about, uh, I think it's about 20, 20 Olympic sized swimming pools, uh, holding 94 million gallons of liquid manure. And it's right along, it's actually the whole, uh, that whole site is a wetland that has been tiled for over a hundred years. 
Uh, and, um, and it still floods. And it still floods. Every spring it floods. This thing will be an environmental hazard the minute it opens. Uh, it's right alongside a stream, uh, which is already impaired due to sediment, like a lot of Green County streams are. That stream dumps into the Little Sugar River, which dumps into Decatur Lake, which is ringed with a lot of $750,000 houses. And from there it goes into the, what they call the race, which we call the mill race, going right into downtown Broadhead. So if this, this facility springs a leak, uh, it'll be an environmental hazard like no one in Wisconsin has ever seen before. Yes? Does Nebraska have some sort of rule that you can't ruin their land and that's why this farm came to well, Actually, it's a longer story than that. It was during the 1970s and 80s. You know, we had a farm crisis in the late 70s and that led to farm aid being started in 85. And that was under um, Reagan and his Secretary of Ag. <coughs> Oh, <laughs> and they eliminated the Farm Home Administration and moved <coughs> over to the Farm Service Agency for loans and thus they just foreclosed. They foreclosed on farms. And we lost a lot of our farmers then. Um, but what then happened is in about the years 1990 or so, as land was getting short in places like Holland, those farmers have to wait to get in line, sort of, to have a quota of milk. And so many of the young ones came here and moved to California. They built the huge farms in California. When I started my research in 2009, at that time, about 92% of farms in Wisconsin had less than 100 cows. 95% had less than 200 cows. And only about 2% had 1,000 cows or more. California was just the opposite. 90% of their farms had over 1,000 cows and only about 5% had fewer than 200 cows. So it was just the opposite. And this is when your favorite commercial started. Happy cows. California's happy cows. Well, that really ticked off the Dairy Business Association and our governor at that time, Jim Doyle. And so they said, we'll show California, we'll raise our production, so we've got not only the happiest cows, but the most amount of milk. And so he started a program called 2020, Dairy 2020. It gave a lot of incentives to overseas investments, and it gave a lot of incentives to larger dairies. And so then we really started saying that the corporatization of, and consolidation of the dairy industry. The interesting thing is that Scott Walker then, of course, could not let a Democrat do anything better than he, so he made it the Dairy 2030 program. He upped the amount of milk. We've already met it. It's not 2020 yet. We've already met the 30 million gallons or whatever it is of milk. The problem is, is that we have an oversupply. And so now our farms are not being able to sell their milk. Some companies, you probably read the paper about grassland mm -hmm. and how they let go 75 farmers. And um, lots of other co-ops picked up one or two or five. And I think all but about four farms were taken in. And those four were ones who wanted to retire anyway. So Grassland Dairies now owns its own CAFOs. As a matter of fact, I was at my little grocery. So I live outside New Glarus, Wisconsin. And, uh, our little grocery store, Roy, Roy's Grocery, I saw yesterday, has grassland butter sitting there, uh, and it's strictly made it from CAFOs. So um, you have to be careful where your food's coming from. Cranberry Creek in Dunn County, if you know folks in Dunn County, that's the CAFO that they bought up there so that they can directly supply their grassland processing plant. So it's vertical integration too, not just consolidation. Walmart is starting to build its own dairies and dairy processing plants. They used to contract with companies like Dean's to provide it, and now they're starting to do their own. We are losing a dairy farm a day, over a dairy farm a day. We lost 500, 500 last, year. last year. In Wisconsin. In Wisconsin. In Wisconsin. Right. And the average age of farmers US-wide is 60. We estimate that 
over the next 15 years, 80% of the arable farmland in the United States will change hands. So the question of who are we, what do we value, what do we want to do about that, is directly related here. In that, who's going to own that farmland? Now we just switch from <coughs> talking about dairy farmers or cows to food security and food sovereignty. And national security. We, we talk a lot here about, <coughs> um, about dairy because that's what you know, Green County is depending on farm land. That's what most, most folks in Wisconsin are dealing with. But um, Minnesota is full of hog farms, and, uh, and Iowa is overrun with hog farms, and they're all moving across the river. So western Wisconsin, uh, I think they're right now, I think, at least six permits for hog farrowing facilities and hog processing facilities in, in, in Crawford County, Grant County, down the western and end of Wisconsin. And of course, the famous one that they want to build in Bayfield. Oh yeah, they want, they want to build one of 20,000 hogs right on, uh, right on the lake. Do I keep flipping sides? So this just tell, shows you about where the, this is a DNR map. Um, there were about 90 Caicos in the year 2000. There are now 280. And there are more permits. This just map just shows you that the red spots are where the Caicos are and then the number of dairy farms within a 10 mile radius. Here's Kiwani County where their wells are polluted. And yeah, here we are. 20,000 people, about 98,000 cows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in County. When we talked about the central sands, that was that middle part. Can't see this very good, but you can see this. If you go to the DNR website, um, this chart will show you. What it's talking about here is here are the counties and let's just take one. Let's take Dane County, since you're mostly familiar with that. So the brown line is dairy, right here. The green line, chickens. This aqua color is beef. And then that is not listed. So something. It has 14. <coughs> no pigs. No Not in Dane County yet. Brown County has 20, Duane has 15. There are uh, two hog uh, CAFOs in Green County. Um, interesting that a CAFO, at least, again, it's an arbitrary number, 1,000 animal units. For pigs, uh, it takes about 2,500 hogs to be considered a CAFO. Now, why that's important is that under 2,500 hogs, the DNR does not enforce anything. They don't even regulate them. Okay, So almost every hog farrowing, hog birthing uh, uh, facility has fewer than 2,500 hogs. 2, 2, it's usually 2,499. Yeah, yeah. Now when they have a fire or they have any kind of problem where they have to report something to the insurance, it's always 2,700 or 2,800. But why, why you ask, well, why is it that, um, that they, can have, they, they sh sh should report 2,500? Uh, how do we know that it has 2,400? He said, well, that's, it's self-reported. They tell, they tell the DNR and the county how many hogs they have, and nobody, hunts, nobody counts the animals. Yes. You are involved with many organizations. Oh, yeah. You're very active. What? Are these organizations doing anything to get rid of Tiffany? Sunday or Tiffany? <laughs> yes. I think a lot of people. A lot of people are. Congressperson. <laughs> yeah, I. Um, Do you remember which district he's in? Where he's in? He's up in the north. Way up north. Yeah. Toxic Tom. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I really don't know um, the answer to that question, but. Uh, you know, when we get to that, those three questions, you know, who are we? You know, what kinds of things do we value, and and what are we planning on doing about it? Well, the next step in a lot of this is get some of these folks out of office. Uh, folks have to be become really active and get some of these folks out of office. Um, I know you have a question. I want to just finish my sentence. Um, 
Sustain Rural Wisconsin Network uh, has a focus right now on a statewide moratorium on CAFOs uh, until such time as we get better control of this process. Repeat that please, Sustain Rural. Sustain Rural Wisconsin Network. If you, if you Google SRWN Wisconsin, there's a whole raft of information on what you can do. The paper uh, that you've got in front of you, the one that says um, the fact sheet has the name of it, the moratorium fact sheet, that came off their website, and also that list of resources that I gave you, that has all the organizations that were throwing their names around. I wanted to get back to your answer your question about California and why they're coming here. You know, California now has had drought for many years, fires the whole bit. <coughs> and Nebraska is not much, that much better. In fact, the Ogawa Aquifer is lowering. And so they need water. A dairy uses how many gallons of water a day? Too many. 92,000, I think, is the number? It's about 100 gallons per animal, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so they need water. <coughs> and then, of course, you have to wash the whole system out. And dairy is one of those industries where you just use a lot of water, whether you're making cheese or milking cows. So they basically are coming here for the water. And because we're dumb about it, we're ignorant. And Harry and I will just tell you a couple of the tricks we've discovered since we started this fight. Um, one is that they may locate on a county line road or a town line road. So the two mm. are fighting about whether to permit it or not. We're for it. We want the economic development. We don't want it. We're worried about our water. Mm. Who's going to fix the road that all those semis are going on? Tension, stress, splits the community. Another example of things we found out. Oh. Todd tells the man who's building the one in Greene County, he applied in 2011 for the stimulus funds that the Obama administration put out to get the economy going, right? Mm -hmm. A board of about eight, nine county board chairs were the committee that decided where that money went. Most of it, most of it went to municipalities who did a lot. Remember the road projects then? I know in Madison you had the really big one on University Avenue that took forever. But that kind of thing was going on. Guess who the only private entity was that got $15 million of that stimulus money? Todd Tulls, because he was building Rock Prairie over by Janesville, and he was going to invigorate the dairy industry. That was the excuse he gave. This lady had a question. I had a comment about t Tiffany. Oh, yeah. I think, yeah, uh, with Patty Shatner's yes. history, um, I have a lot of hope, and I think I think this gentleman has a very strong point because the power, we have lost so much power. It, it's breaking my heart that a Democratic governor started this all. It's, it's just took the wind out of me when you said that. But Patty Shatner, the one, I talked to her the third week in December. She had thirty. And I can. I asked her if I could share this with people. Thirty thousand dollars. Adam Ch Chocolate. I don't know his last name very well. Had one hundred thirty-five thousand dollars in three weeks with the help of the, of the Democratic Party. Mark Miller from was a, a senator down in Madison, and uh, Jenny Dye who was the chair of the the campaign committee for the uh, state senate. Fundraised three hundred thousand dollars in six weeks. The interesting thing is that Adam went up to $1.3 million, in, and Patty won by 10%. So there is a lot of excitement, and, and she's given, she was all over the country because of that win. And this was the Sheila Hartstor uh, seat. So I, 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 I think, and I know I feel, um, that we are part of this, this sweeping um, electric, that people are paying attention. We're not the only ones anymore. And it sure feels good. And I think your voices will be heard stronger and louder. I think you do need to work with the legislators more in the candidates. Uh, the, the people are running for governor. It's very, very important. The lieutenant governor, uh, one of them were here, was here today. 
Um, this is so. This is our heritage. Can I speak to that one? Yeah. So Harry and I both belong to um, Wisconsin Farmers Union. Yep. Which is a grassroots network that, yep. of farmers that's been around since the 30s. We're the ones who started the co-op system in Wisconsin for farmers, and uh, we are doing that. <laughs> Let me just give you back an example. Um, so Harry and I were on the Regan County Roundtable. You know that AFL-CIO thing to get the community grassroots movement going. And um, then I was with Farmers Union uh, for Green Lafayette and Rock. It's called South Central Farmers Union. And then we had some friends like Jeanette who were in United to a Men yeah. and also sat on the Dems. And then, you know, people like us sit on many different things. We have lots of different interests. But when that dairy came in, we all worked together. When Harry ran for county board, all those organizations had folks helping him. When another one ran for county board. But what we're doing is we just had five workshops on dairy supply management, that whole Canada thing. We um, had our convention in February, first week, and we had about nine of the candidates there at that time. Plus Josh Call, plus were they listening to you? Or was you bet they were listening okay. to us. We had two hours with them. That's what I was yeah. Good. One of our folks is Sarah Lloyd, who's co-chair oh, of our Wisconsin yeah. Revolution yeah. and ran for Greg Glenbrook. Let's see. She works with Farmers Union, too. So, yeah, we're on it. We're even starting to get some nudges from the Farm Bureau. I, I would, yeah. <laughs> nudges, baby steps. <laughs> But yeah, we're working, but not only that, we're working with our neighbors. And the thing that's happening is it's popping up all over the place. It's Janesville, it's Green County, it's Lafayette and Grant, it's Dunn, it's St. Croix, it's Bayfield, it's Kiwani, it's Calumet, it's all the counties and they're all coming to the same point, not all, many of them are coming to this point of saying, this has gotten away from us. 2004, many of you may have been on your um, county's planning commission when you did the smart growth plans. Your town boards were doing that back in about 2005. Well, in 2006 is when the livestock siting law was passed. And that's what took local control away because, you know, you sure wouldn't want those big pay posts to have to go through all that burdensome regulation, right? Oh. We should just make it all the same so it's fair for everybody. You don't have to deal with all those counties and townships. And that was when the trouble started. So one of the things, resolutions that we passed, and we also worked with the Conservation Congress, was to start, uh, have resolutions passed on doing hydrogeological studies on all counties that haven't had them. Declaring cars Photography is geology is being ultra sensitive. And the one I'm really proud of, because Harry and I worked for it and spoke to it, was at the Wisconsin State Farm, uh, Farmers Convention, Union Convention. We passed a resolution in special order of business to restore local control of livestock siting. Mm -hmm. yes. And it passed yes. unanimously. You yes. could have heard a pin drop. <laughs> Not one no. The Wisconsin Farmers Union is a very progressive organization, yeah. as opposed to the Farm Bureau, which is not. Yeah. Um, Generally. <laughs> General. And um, uh, when something uh, becomes a matter of policy, then our legislative advocates uh, go to the legislature and speak on these, on these issues. When it becomes uh, a special order of business, there are only six out of about 70 pages of, of policy, uh, there are only six special orders of business, and this store local control is one of them. So uh, the Farmers Union has uh, right, involved right, right, broadband. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Questions? What? What? Uh, yeah. Generally, when you see something like this that involves a lot of activity, a lot of investment you'll see clustered around in some kind of overreaching organization that kind of divvies up territories. You'll see certain law firms' names appearing over and over again. Huh? If you're um, lucky, you'll see certain investigative journalists beginning to look at it. Can <coughs> you identify any of those things? That Michael always, Best and Friedrich comes Michael to Best mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There is an organization... <laughs> 
Is that appointed to the EPA person? Yeah, there's a there's a um, there's an organization in Wisconsin called the Dairy Business Association. There are several dairy organizations. And I don't want to speak negatively about any but one. Um, the Dairy Business Association is a very large uh, organization, uh, large in the sense that it's deep, deep pockets. Um, it um, to be along to that, uh, you pay a dollar fifty per cow you have. And um, uh, so you can figure that the, the average membership for, say, CAFOs even, because we have 300 and some of them, and the, the numbers of cows go anywhere between 1,500 and, and 13,000. Um, so they pay $1.50 per cow. So they have very, very deep pockets. They spent millions of dollars, we heard it earlier today, uh, uh, in Walker's gubernatorial campaigns. Uh, they spent a lot of money uh, uh, on legislative races. Uh, Brad Schimmel, I think Josh Call spoke about Brad Schimmel today. Uh, I've had a couple of private conversations with Josh about uh, a woman named Wildeman, uh, whom Brad Schimmel just hired in January uh, to be the head of the Environmental Protection Unit at the, at the, at the uh, Wisconsin Department of Justice. Uh, she came uh, from, she was an environmental attorney for, uh, for Michael Best and Friedrich defending CAFOs uh, against lawsuits regarding their manure problems. Uh, so um, the, um, the fox is living in the hen house right now. But 2018 is an election year. Yeah. Vote them out. Yeah, it is. You know, it, it, these are just reasons to do it. I mean, everybody talks about we ought to do this, we ought to do that. But... Um, uh, we are losing family farms. We're losing. Uh, we're losing whole communities. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of an anecdote that may sound sort of obtuse, but uh, I, I grew up in in West Virginia, and um, uh, around the turn of the last century, uh, most of West Virginia, which is largely 85 percent forested, was clear cut, uh, and um, timbering was a big, big, big business there. Uh, just kind of like CAFOs are a big business here. Uh, and, uh, but there were all sorts of towns, 5,000 people here, 10,000 people, 15,000 people someplace else, but very remote areas. Uh, and when the timber business went up, when it went out, you drive down through or go back, I grew like backpacking back, back, uh, back in that part of the country, and uh, there are nothing but foundations. Uh, and that's what's happening to rural communities when these CAFOs come in because family farmers buy from the local hardware store. They buy from the local grocery store. They get their loan from the local bank. They buy their, their, their uh, farm implements from the local farm implement dealer. Once one of these uh, CAFOs come into an, to an area, then they buy them on the, on the open market from whoever is the le least expensive across the country. Uh, and uh, this... Uh, uh, this fellow, uh, Tulls is his last name, who's uh, building the facility in Broadhead. Um, yeah, he grew up in Nebraska. He buys all of his all of his feed, all his everything from someplace else. He doesn't buy locally. Uh, and, um, and that Whereas a family a farmer usually puts 95 cents of every dollar he earns back into his local community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's what we face. <clears throat> what do you think um, is going to happen with these tariffs now, and the you know with China and the tariffs and the trade wars? I just I'm real curious how that's going to affect the cables, because most of them you know the, the animals are going to China to be processed there and then come back here as feed. And so I'm just kind of what's going to happen? Do you guys have any ideas? Farmers Union is what I know most about. And they were against the TTP. And if you stop at the Family Farm Defenders group on the other side, um, pick up some of their stuff on tariffs and um, what's going on with that. It's interesting to hear what the uh, Canadian farmers said about it because they have a lot of whey powder and dried milk coming in from Australia and other places. Not New Zealand so much because they've had a drought, but. Um, some of the other countries, and it's kind of upsetting their market too. But 
Um, and they still export some, but it's a very fine balance in that. How can these organizations uh, continue to expand when milk prices are dropping? Well, Farmers Union did a dairy survey two years ago, and um, they had a good response. It was a valid study. And the large farms that answered the questions were actually losing more money per cow than the small farms. Mm -hmm. The larger the farm, they were up to like $1.96 per cow per month. And the... Uh, uh, or per day, and the smaller farms were more at like $1.29. They were all losing money. When you talk about investment, and we talk about banking, and we talk about Dodd-Frank, and we talk about bank reform, those guys get the money. There's this new thing, way to get around corporate ownership of farmland in Wisconsin, even though we have, from the 1970s, a law in Wisconsin that you can't have corporate ownership of land. Well, they're getting around it through this principal investment entity mm -hmm. and LLCs now. <clears throat> and, and that's how they're doing it, because those have no liability, for one thing, so they may not even have to pay it back. And they get all of this investment from groups that, frankly, are investing the money in running an office losses sometimes, mm -hmm. whereas my dairy farm would never be able to tap into that kind of money. So you're right, it's a crooked system kind of from top to bottom. Do you see Wall Street money flowing into this? Yes. About three years ago, Forbes magazine that I just happened to, you know how Facebook is, they show you things that you may not be necessarily interested in. But there was an article, uh, like a cover of Forbes magazine, and right on the cover was, the land is the best investment. Mm -hmm. So I had to read the article, and it was all about how to get into buying agricultural land. But that was the next big thing. That and water were the new oil. Yep. Yep. And so, yeah, they're looking at it. Yeah, um, from what I've read, the geology of Delaney County yes. uh, was just horrible for this because they're, they're bedrock or something like that. Depth to bedrock. Um, mm -hmm. I've got a 180 foot rock. And I'm not there's no big capitals around. But I'm just wondering, you know, we got a, a big operation on Highway 14 up there at Schmitz. I don't know where that water is going. My understanding is they're building another operation up on one of the ridges of the county. And uh, can you tell me how long did it take for this manure and that? You want to take that one, or you want me to? The I, 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 I can take that. I can take that. Another thing I did back home, back home, back in West Virginia when I was a kid, is I was a spelunker, and I crawled through caves formed by water in limestone bedrock. West Virginia is underlain by karst, limestone bedrock, just like. Now, if I can bring up a picture of, uh, of uh, Wisconsin again, that's uh, so bad. Got to be one here okay. someplace. There you go. Yeah, this one. That work? This one. That works. Okay. So, <coughs> this is central sand in here. That's a bad place to put a cake, though, because anything you put on the ground took it right down into the ground right away. 20 minutes. 20 minutes through sand. Water will All through here is karst bedrock. Okay? Uh, up here, this was all glaciated, you know, tens of thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. And so you have extremely shallow soils. Sometimes you could scuttle your feet and, and find the bedrock. Uh, and in this case, because this was glaciated, a lot of this has been open to the, uh, to the water for a long time. And you have lots of cracks and fissures and sinkholes and so forth. So this is very, very susceptible to immediate contamination of the groundwater. Mm -hmm. That's what they're having the most problems with in that, in that uh, by the way, the fellow with the blonde hair in there, Lynn Utech, good friend of mine. Um, down this th through here, this is a different kind of karst bedrock. This was, they called the driftless area, it was not glaciated. Uh, so what happens here is that the, the, um, uh, the aquifers are all sandstone, uh, and above them and below them are limestone. And um, 
The water coming down through there makes um, underground rivers and streams. Uh, they have mapped uh, uh, transport of water from one place to another a uh, quarter mile in 20 minutes, laterally. So uh, you could be getting contamination from miles away. Mm -hmm. uh, strong encouragement that we have for folks is to um, test your water at least every year, once a year, because you never know when something might happen. I know it's sound like scare tactics, tactics, but I'm sorry. That's it's, it's the way it is. You yeah. might be interested to know on the whole um, government part of it that um, just last week, Jennifer Schilling introduced, that there was a bill that came up introduced by her um, to require the DNR, as soon as they get a report of a spill within 24 hours to contact the um, County Health Department of where the spill took place so that those county health departments can get the word out because when Emerald Sky had its spill, it took, they still don't have a, I don't think they still have a direct answer of it. Just well, people notice their wells are bad. Do you know about Emerald Sky? No. St. Croix County, the town of Emerald, uh, the same people who are building the facility in, uh, in Broadhead. Um, uh, bought a farm up there, uh, which had been a case of a small one. Uh, and um, in, I think, late March, early April of last year, um, an anonymous tipster told the DNR that there had been a spill. Uh, hundreds of thousands of gallons of manure went into, a, into a, an outdoor pond. Not, not a, not a, uh, Is this concern becoming greater to the point of political power? Yes, uh, and that's what I meant when I said it's kind of like one of those kids for free. Because it's, because it's popping up all over. Because I'll tell you, all around our area, there was walker signs and Trump signs, yeah, and you know, is it going to be different this year? Anybody. I don't know. They were doing an investigation. <laughs> because <laughs> after the last two <laughs> elections, <laughs> Yeah, the, the, right. the quick yeah, answer is if you get out and do something, you yeah. know, exactly. if you and people you know get out and, and, and say, look, this is this is a problem, um, and you folks are responsible for it. Not not you, the, 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 the legislators are the ones responsible for it. Yeah, you know, and that's why. <laughs> well, yes, exactly. And now the wetlands. Because no, it's not going to be just about that. It's going to be about Todd Tell's building his cave home on the web. Is it going to be different this year? But they're going to make it. I don't. Yeah, I think only if we make it. Yeah, right. We don't have it in the pool. You might be too low. Get out and say, this is a problem. Uh, and you folks are responsible for it. Well, you know, that's interesting you say that because no, Carrie and I were at one of the meetings. Yeah, they voted down the board meetings yeah, where the county board was asking questions of their local land and conservation person who has probably put about 50, over $50,000 worth of labor into this. Um, and we had Mark Spreitzer, Jennifer, uh, not Jennifer Schilling, um, Janice Ringham, Sandy Polk. Green County has three assembly people and three state senators, uh, just even in the city of Monroe. So they were all there. Those were there. Todd Novak was not there. Mm -hmm. Howard Markline was not there. They were all invited. And we stood right in a little circle like this and said, will you please just introduce reopening that livestock siding line? Just write a bill to reopen it. And they said, well, it won't go anywhere. And we said, try anyway. Well, this has and to be an election thing. issue. That's, so that's, that's it's going to have to be an election from. issue. You know, people need, to, yeah. people need yeah. to be wakened uh, to the problem. Uh, I mean, six months ago, uh, we approached people in Broadhead who did not know what a CAFO was. They didn't know that this facility was being built five miles, miles from town. 
they don't read the paper, they don't watch anything but Fox News, you know, um, and, um, uh, but that was six months ago. Now, with some diligent effort on the part of people who live in Broadhead, more and more people are aware <coughs> of what's going on. Uh, and I think it, it needs to be something that needs to be brought before the electorate and say, you know, this particular individual is causing the problem that's happening all over the state. And um, we need to change that. The other thing that really strikes people, could you get the slide back? They yeah. Didn't. Okay. Go to about awesome. the last four. Okay. Another thing that people just, the things that I have said to people that really get their brains moving on this, because I, we're giving you a lot of technical talk that we wouldn't necessarily go into, is this CAFO is going to produce as much sewage as the city of Janesville on 127 acres. That they get with no waste treatment facility. Mm -hmm. So when you put it in that kind of a context, then get it. When you say, Todd Tulls is not just building Rock Prairie and Pinnacle or Emerald Sky, which I think he bought because we were starting to give him a little bit of hassle. He wants his goal, and he will say it to you, is that he has a God-given talent to milk cows, and he wants to have 20,000 cows in the state of Wisconsin. That is his goal. So if he gets four of these dairies, he will have his 20,000 cows. When you tell people that, they go, oh, so like this isn't just my neighbor guy wanting to get a little bit bigger, you know, going from 200 to 300 cows. No. Whole different picture. Whole different thing. He needed 6,000 acres to put manure on. Our first citizen action was to go to our neighbors in that five mile radius that they wanted to get all the manure contracts on because that's their nutrient management program that has to get approved by the DNR. They had to have signed contracts for those 6,000 acres. We went to all the neighbors and said, don't sign the contract till you know more about this. Now they have to go 20 miles. This actually, maybe I'm being too optimistic here, I think our Pinnacle Dairy in Green County may be the one that the DNR finally says, yeah, you've had your six tries of trying to rewrite this program and it's still not good. I just got, uh, just got an update from the Atlanta Water Conservation Department in Green County. Uh, they've kept a timeline of this whole process over the last few years. And um, one of the uh, one of the last things on the timeline was from uh, about a week ago. The co county conservationists went out to investigate the site, just to take a look, see what was going on, and they had been required by the conditions that the county put on the on the permit to drill eight monitoring wells uh, to see how wa how high the water was getting. Because if you have a uh, if you have a manure, manure lagoon. That is, you know, it's this deep. And the water table can't be up above the bottom of it, otherwise hydrostatic pressure causes uh, structural problems for the, for the, uh, for the manure lagoon. But they were like anywhere between a foot and four feet higher than it could be. Um, and uh, so they asked them to drill these monitoring wells, but they've been in there for quite some time now. But he said there were hoses in these wells, and they were pumping the water out of the mine. Oh, yeah, they are something. And when he brought he brought that the attention of the oh, by the way, he never goes out there when the when the owner doesn't have somebody from Michael Best and Krieger standing there beside him. Oh, Jesus! Uh, and uh, the attorney says, well, there's nothing in your condition that says we can't pump water out of the test wells. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I have a practical question. I meet with a bunch of women Monday mornings and we write letters and, and call our congresspeople and legislators. Are you the Iowa group? I'm no, um, we're actually, well, yeah. I we meet in, in base, at base camp in Mesa. But anyway, um, are there specific names and numbers of bills we can address? We can say, fight this to our, to our um, local congresspeople. And, and Representatives. Yeah. Take take one. Take our business cards. We have them here. Okay. Please take them, and um, we'll put you on the Green County defending our farmland list, or also the far or join Farmers Union, okay. because they have two legislative um, liaisons, Kara O'Connor, and we are getting a new one, 
who have, are in Madison and on, in the Capitol all the time, and they let us know what's coming up. They'll, we'll even get the notices like on a Friday night for the hearing on Monday, we get those. So, yes, do. So, yeah, we're very happy to, to work with you. Um, <coughs> Getting bills off SB 76. It's already no. You don't 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 write that down. <laughs> That's one that I'm very familiar with. That's uh, SB 76 and 8. Those were um, those were the high capacity well bills. Actually, we wrote that in those. Yeah. <laughs> okay, which basically says that they can take out as much water as they want to in perpetuity, and nobody analyzes the permit. And uh, yes, sir. Are there? I've kind of lost track of this. I thought there was some legislation being proposed or so on regulating aerial spraying of manure. Yes. Um, is that statewide? Pat? Aerial aerial spraying, like the big, um, yeah, that had a moratorium on it, and I haven't heard that it's been lifted. I, the other thing is the manure pipelines. There was a little known um, legislation that was in committee, the transportation committee, and it had to do with giving the North pipelines the same rights as uh, power lines, mm -hmm. sewer lines, gas wow. lines, uh -huh. that kind of thing that would allow them to put them within 100 feet of your well, actually. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we can in the ditch. aim them for Michael Best and Free. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, there are things like that, but we, we, we found out about that soon enough and got the word out soon enough that they, that part was dropped. So there still can be some pressure left. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any question? Yeah. Um, I'll share something. Um, I have been um, starting to get involved with some groups um, for community rights, and I, have you heard of, do you know oh, Paul, yes. Paul Cienfuegos? Oh, yes. Well, see, this is how it all, <laughs> I met Carrie, this is how it works, this is how it percolates, this is why we are the grassroots um, network. What Carrie Paul, and I do What love. Paul is doing is, um, he's working with townships across the country, um, some have been quite successful, um, and the, the truth is, that corporations have all the rights now. They have all the rights of people, and and our our rights as people and local legislation have been taken away from us. And so they're going back. They're going back to get your local representatives, your your, your councils, what, whoever, to rewrite local laws. And this is like a form of um, uh, disobedience because these local laws that you now newly create m will be in contrast to or against state laws or even federal laws. But you have to rewrite the local ordinances. And if you do, um, to prote protect your water, your soil, your air, um, you know, get those ordinances written now. If nothing else, it, it deters corporations or KCOs from coming in because they don't want to deal with places that are organized already. They That's don't right. want to deal with citizens that are already organized. And if we get enough people rewriting local ordinances, you know, maybe in the future. He loves that concept. <laughs> <laughs> so on the Sustain Rural Wisconsin Network website, they've got a number of sample ordinances that oh, are yeah. either already have been written and, and passed by um, there's, there's local townships for, for and that you can just copy and then make into your own for your own specific yep. issues. So. Mm -hmm. And that was why we put that one up, is because we really do want a moratorium statewide. Counties are doing it, we can have one statewide. Yeah. And I think our county boards that have had to go through this process are ready to do it. Yes. So. Letter writing, letters to the editor are great. If you have a local newspaper, you can get on the good side of the editor and have them interview people. That's great. Yeah. Local radio. So one of the things, I don't know if Harry said this or not, but one of the things that's going around in our fight right now is to really concentrate on the questions, who are we? What do we value or care about? 
And then what are we willing to do to protect those things that we care about? And these three questions, of course, could be asked about anything, whether it's frac sand mining, or if it's color lines, or if it's wetlands, or if it's made to amend, all of those things. And I'm sure everybody in this room has five things that they're working on, or 10, or campaigns, <coughs> right? Because we're the ones who show up.